Well, hey, welcome to Auckland EV. I'm Rowan, one of the pastors here. I don't know how you felt this week. I don't know what it's been like from where you sit, but you haven't got to look long at the world around us to work out that something is not right. Sickness, war, greed, death. The world isn't as it ought to be. And it makes you ask the question, what is wrong with this world? Well, last week, as we were looking into the book of Judges, we saw that Israel's deliverer, Samson, was a man that saw the world through his own eyes. He did whatever he saw was fit and right. And that God's people had done what was right in their own eyes as well. But that God used the brokenness of Samson to cause a moment to bring his people back to himself and fix perhaps some of the problems of the world of that time. But as we get to the last episode in the book of Judges this week, we see the, camps, the cancer has spread. The world of the Judges has deteriorated to an all-time low, a world that is shocking and not good. Judges 17, 6 says this, In those days there was no king in Israel, and everyone did whatever seemed right to him. Literally, everyone did what was right in their own eyes. The book of Judges has been a downward spiral, and today we're going to hit rock bottom. What we have in front of us is one of the most difficult parts of the Bible that you'll ever come across. My guess is you haven't heard many talks on Judges 17 to 21. It's not really a section of the Bible that the kids' story Bibles love to bring out or that people crochet and put on as wall art, outlining the story of what goes on. There are no heroes. There are no morals. There's no instruction of what to do from the Creator. It's just violence and stupidity, rape, destruction. It's horrible. And its characters are just hypocrites. It begs the question, how far down do Israel need to go before they recognize the goodness of God? Before they turn and accept his love and mercy and start seeing the world through God's eyes? How did the world get to this state? But the Bible isn't just a book about another people who live long ago. We read and hear this story because in it, God addresses you and me. How far from him will we turn? How far from him will you and I be determined to run? How how low will our moral characters drop before we turn and see God's mercy? That's the question God wants us to ask as we look at the problems of the world, to look at the problems of ourselves and the problems that we cause. Now, the last chapter in the book of Judges is a story God wants every one of us to hear because through it, we're going to see there is only one hero and it's not you and me. And what I want to do today is something a little bit different in the way we go through the passage. I just want us to look at the story together and and see what goes on and really let it impact us as the author has written it to do. While it's a devastating story, it's a story we need to hear. Judges 17.1 starts like this. There was a man from the hill country of Ephraim named Micah. He said to his mother, The 1,100 pieces of silver taken from you that I heard you utter a curse about. Here, I have the silver with me. I took it, so now I return it to you. And his mother said, My son, you are blessed by the Lord. Now, the thing that's odd as we start out this passage is this man, Micah. You know, Micah means how great is God. But here he's not very great at all. He's a thief. He's stealing money from his mum. Look at verse 3. He returned the 1,100 pieces of silver to his mother. And his mother said, I personally consecrate the silver to the Lord for my son's benefit, who will make a carved image overlaid with silver. So he returned the silver to his mother and she took five pounds of silver and gave it to a silversmith. He made it into a carved image overlaid with silver and it was in Micah's house. Now, what's the problem with the story? The problem is, Deuteronomy 12 had told God's people it is repulsive to God to worship anything that is not him. Anything that isn't him is an idol. And that's repulsive because it has done nothing. No, we know God through his words, never through statues. And this man, Micah, in verse 5, has a shrine and he makes an ephod and builds household idols. Literally a, a house of gods is what it is in the Hebrew. And he installs one of his sons to be a priest. Now, this is weird as well, right? It's kind of like he's gone to Noel Leeming and he's seen a home entertainment system and he wants to install it. But this time it's not a home entertainment system. He's installed God, a little mini God and a God communication system, a priest. He's like, yes, that's what I need to make my blessing good. I'm going to do it. We read from verse seven. 
there was a young man, a Levite from Bethlehem in Judah, who resided within the clan of Judah. The man left the town of Bethlehem in Judah to settle wherever he could find a place. On his way, he came to Micah's home in the hill country of Ephraim. Where do you come from? Micah asked him. He answered him, I'm a Levite from Bethlehem in Judah and I'm going to settle wherever I can find a place. Micah replied, stay with me and be my father and priest and I'll give you four ounces of silver a year along with your clothing and provisions. (laughs) Here we've got a priest who's willing to be bought from the the line of of the Levites, the the priestly line that were to be the the go-betweens, the high priest between God and his people. And what Micah's trying to do here is to set up his own kind of relationship with God separate to the way God had set it up previously. He's trying to guarantee God's blessing. He spent 20 years worth of salary, 20 years on making an idol, but he needs it to work. So in verse 11, the Levite went in and agreed to stay with the man. And the young man became like one of the sons. Micah concentrated, consecrated the Levite and the young man became his priest and lived in Micah's house. Then Micah said, now I know the Lord will be good to me because a Levite has become my priest. Now I know the Lord will be good to me because a Levite has become my priest. What a shocker. He's trying to guarantee God's goodness by getting a priest in his house and a mini God, even though it's directly against what God had said in Deuteronomy 12, 8. Do not set up shrines or places to worship God apart from where I have done it. Then in verse 18, we're introduced to the Danites. Now, uh, Dan uh, had land in the middle of Israel. Uh, They'd not kicked out the Amorites. So uh, they were looking for somewhere else to live. Uh, You can see where they are on the map here. So so what they do is they, they send five men looking for another place to stay. They travel way up north and they see Micah's house. And when they see it, they look in and they see not his plasma TV, but his idol and the priest. And they're like, man, Mike has got his own Levite priest. We want one of those. In verse seven of chapter 18, the five men left and came to Laish. They saw that the people who were there were living securely in the same way as the Sidonians, quiet and unsuspecting. There was nothing lacking in the land and no oppressive ruler. They were far from the Sidonians having no allegiance alliances with anyone. But here's the thing, Laish is outside of Israel. It's outside of the God, the place God had given Israel to live. And this tribe are thinking, man, we're going to live somewhere away from where God told us to. But Laish is, is so good. It doesn't matter. Here's where we're supposed to be. Look at how great it is, how, how blessed it is. The people here are so peaceful, so unsuspecting. We can just come and knock them out and then we'll be done. So the five men, they go back to the Danites. Let's take this land off them. The Danites agree. Uh, And on the way to Laish, what happens? They stop at Micah's house for a quick chat. Of course they do. And they steal the idol. And in doing so, they bump into the priest. Look what happens next. Verse 18, verse 19 in chapter 18. They told the priest, be quiet. Keep your mouth shut. Come with us. Be a father and priest to us. It's better for you to be a priest for the house of one person or for you to be the priest of a tribe and family in Israel. So the priest was pleased and took an ephod, household idols and carved image and went with the people. Again, the priest is bought. He's supposed to be helping people to understand God's word and and, and bringing them to him. But he's just happy to go wherever they want to take him. And then what happens is Micah, here's what's happened. They've stolen his idol and his priest. And so he comes running after them. The Danites turn around and basically ask him, what's your problem? Micah says, you took the idol I made and my priest. Now think about it for a moment. A God who can be stolen is a dumb God. You want to worship a God that can be stolen, that can be taken away? He even says that he made it. No, there's only one creature in humanity that knows what to do with statues and idols, and that's pigeons. And you know what I mean. They are not, they are not anything helpful for us at all. The Danites gear up for battle in verse 16. But in verse 27, we see this. After they'd taken the gods Micah had made and the priests that belonged to him, they went to Laish to a quiet and unsuspecting people. They killed them with their swords and burned down the city. There was no one to rescue them because it was far from Sidon and they had no alliance with anyone. It was in a valley that belonged to Beth Rehob. Now, 
At this moment, this is God's people doing this. God's not told them to do it. There's no judgment on the other nations. They're just going and taking over people with, with, with no direction at all from God in this sense. Verse 29, they, they named the city Dan after the, the name of their ancestor Dan, who was born in Israel. But the city was formerly named Laish. The Danites then set up these carved images for themselves. Jonathan, son of Gershom, son of Moses and his sons were priests for the Danite tribe until the time of the exile from the land. So they set up for themselves Micah's carved image that he had made. And it was there as long as the house of God was in Shiloh. Now, at first glance, it looks like blessing has come to Micah and the Danites. It looks like it's it's evidence of God's providence and, and, and approval of all their acts. But here's the thing. Blessing does not mean God's approval. Just because someone is blessed in a situation in life doesn't mean God has necessarily said that's the right thing to do. This chapel, this temple to God in the hills is an abomination to him. The temptation for us is to think about our circumstances as when they go well, that they affirm our actions. But circumstances are dumb. And I mean that in in the literal sense. They do not speak. We can't get guidance from circumstances. Like the idols these people have created, so are circumstances. They're all dumb. They do not speak. They do not give God's verdict. Just because it went well for them in the short term doesn't mean God is happy. He's given his word on how they should have responded. If only they'd just obeyed and driven out the people before them where they were in the middle of Israel. Now, there's a lesson in this for all of us here as well. We have an even clearer word from God through Jesus than they had then. We know how God wants us to act. And we know the areas he's been clear in how we should act. Yet so often we justify ourselves ignoring God's word uh, just a little, then a little more because it had a seemingly positively out, positive outcome. Or we take the word of God and we make it say more than what it says and, and use it to justify my own desires to be anti-authoritarian or to, to stand up for certain things when we maybe ought not. We have to carefully come to the word of God and work out what he's saying. But friends, we have the word of God. Watch what happens to Israel when they reject his word in the end. God's judgment are going to come on his people and it will be very clear and the outcome is going to be disastrous. Well, further on down the spiral, we go into chapter 19 and it's much, much worse. It's full of spineless men. Chapter 19, verse 1. In those days when there was no king in Israel, a Levite, living in a remote part of the hill country of Ephraim, acquired a woman from Bethlehem in Judah as his concubine. Now, a concubine was truly a wife, but kind of like second or third in the pecking order. Um, Now, well, it's true that in the Old Testament, um, there definitely are people that have multiple wives. And it's true the Old Testament never overtly condemns polygamy. It's not the pattern God set up. From Abraham through Jacob down to Solomon, the practice of polygamy, having multiple wives, always brings heartache and pain without exception. God is clear that marriage is for one man and one woman, no more. Verse 2 we read, But this concubine was unfaithful to him. Literally, she played the harlot, committed adultery, and left him for her father's house in Bethlehem in Judah. She was there for a period of four months. Then her husband got up and went after her to speak kindly to her and bring her back. He had the servant with him and a pair of donkeys. So she brought him to her father's house. And when the girl's father saw him, he he gladly welcomed him. His father-in-law, the girl's father, detained him and he stayed with him for three days. They ate and drank and spent the nights there. Now, at first glance, again, it seems this father is hospitable. He agrees to give the girl back to the husband. But here's the thing. There's no record of the girl agreeing. Both father and husband treat her as an object. The father wants to avoid the disgrace of his daughter's adultery, and the husband just wants to secure sexual favors from her. Neither care about the woman herself, and we're going to see that. On the fifth day, Five days in, the the dads tried to keep him there and say, stay, stay, take the girl, take the girl. On the fifth day, um, the the husband is like, man, we've got to go. You you can't stay with the in-laws for too long. I think that's that's the picture. They got 50 Ks to go. It starts to get dark. Verse 11 in chapter 19. When they were near Jebus and the day was almost gone, the servant said to his master, 
please, why not let us stop at this Jebusite city and, and spend the night there? Now, Jebusite city, Jebus means Jerusalem, but it hadn't been taken until the time of David much later. So it's still a foreign nation, Jerusalem, at this point in time. The master replies in verse 12, but his master replied to him, we will not stop at a foreign city where there are no Israelites. Let's move on to Gibeah. Come on, he said, let's try to reach one of those places and spend the night in, in Gibeah or Ramah. So they continue their journey and, and the sun set as they need Gibeah in Benjamin. There's a sense where we read the story here and you kind of relax. Ah, oh, well, Benjamin, our tribe of Israel, they're brothers. It's where Ehud left from, the left-handed 007 Benjaminite. That's where he was from, right? But there's a problem in this place. Things aren't as they should have been. Verse 15, they stop and, and they go in and uh, in the night in Gibeah. Then a Levite goes in and sits down in, in, in the city square, but no one took them into their home to spend the night there. So he's sitting in the city square and, and no one would welcome him in. In this culture, hospitality was a massive deal, but the only one that took them in wasn't a local. Verse 16, in the evening, an old man came in from his work in the field he was from the hill country of Ephraim, but was residing in Gibeah. And the men of that place were Benjaminites. Right? The old man knows there's a problem in town. He says, you, you can't stay here. Don't be in the center of this, this town square. Even though they're from Israel, even though they're, they're part of your people, of God's people, it's not good for you to be here. Peace to you, he says in verse 20, the old man. I'll take care of everything you need. Don't spend the night in the square. We're going to find out why soon enough. Verse 22, while they're enjoying themselves, all of a sudden, perverted men of the city surrounded the house and beat on the door. They said to the old man who was the owner of the house, bring out the man who came to your house so we can have sex with him. You're like, what? This is Israel. These, these are God's people. It sounds like what happened in Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis 19, right? Where God wiped the whole city out because of their perversion, but they weren't God's people at this time. This is God's people. This is the depths that they've gone to. And the Levites' response is just as spineless as Lot's was. Look at verse 23. The owner of the house went out and said to them, No, don't do this evil, my brothers. After all, this man has come into my house. Don't do this horrible thing. Here, let me bring out my virgin daughter and the man's concubine. Use them and do whatever you want to them. But do not do this horrible thing to this man. But the men would not listen to him. What should have happened here? Surely it was time for the men to man up, to show some courage and say no and to look after these women. But the only thing that's displayed here is utter cowardness. It's unbelievable. Verse 25. So the man, the Levite, seized his concubine, took her outside to them, and they raped her and abused her all night until morning. At daybreak, they let her go. Early that morning, the woman made her way back. And as it was getting light, she collapsed at the doorway of the man's house where her master was. You can kind of tell, even the narrator finds it hard to tell this story. But the wrongness of the passage doesn't stop here. Listen to verse 27. When a master got up in the morning, he opened the door of the house and went out to leave on his journey. There was the woman, his concubine, collapsed near the doorway of the house with her hands on the threshold. Get up, he told her. Let's go. But there was no response. Now, this makes me so angry. This is wrong. God, his word, the Bible, it, it does not condone this behavior. It is repulsive. It's the polar opposite of how everything should be. It's the opposite of how God made sex to be, to be enjoyed with a husband and wife. It's the opposite of how God made women to be treated. It's the opposite of how men should have acted to protect them. This is wrong on so many levels. It's wrong and we're supposed to be angry at the wrongness of what is going on here. What happens next, if that wasn't enough, is utterly bizarre. Verse 29 of Judges 19. When he entered his house, he's gotten home, right? He picked up a knife, took hold of his concubine who's dead, and cut her into 12 pieces limb by limb, and then sent her throughout the territory of Israel. He's basically DHL'd her across the nation. 
what is going on? A moment ago, he seemed un, so unconcerned about what happened, but now he, he sends her body parts around Israel. What is happening here? Well, he wants vengeance on the men of Gibeah. He doesn't care about the way this woman was treated. He just wants vengeance. And so what he does is he's concerned for his loss of property. This woman was his. How dare they do this to her? And so he sends evidence of what has happened to all the other tribes of Israel, showing them what's gone on. They killed this woman and he sends body parts as a very clear message. What you're seeing here is both men treat this woman as a lump of meat. It is so wrong. And while it seems so offensive, perhaps it's worth asking ourselves, are there ways in which we should listen to this and its critique of the culture that we live in, particularly the way we should view women, the way we treat women, the way we we, we look at women? You see here the way that men are doing it and it's portrayed as wrong, it's disastrous, yet we so often do the same thing. God created women as equal in value, equal in worth, equal in every way. How dare we objectify women as some sort of commodity or possession? Whether we do that in person and cross lines we ought not cross and take people who who aren't our spouse. Whether we do it with people on a screen and and, and satisfy ourselves with what we look at. Whether we we think through the way we, we act before we're married or when we're not married to others, perhaps living in the same house of someone that we're dating and going further than we ought, sharing a bedroom with someone who we're not married to. Guys, this is a strong and firm word to us today. Treat women with love and respect and care, not as an object for your gratification. That is wrong. Christian men, we need to stand up for and love and protect women as our equals in the way we act ourselves, in the way we think ourselves. Well, if vengeance is what this man wants, vengeance is what he gets. His publicity stunt works. Look at verse 30. Everyone who saw it said nothing like this has ever happened or has been seen since the day the Israelites came out of the land of Egypt to this day. Think it over, discuss it and speak up. Now, you notice in this whole section, there's no judge. There's, there's, there's no horrible, oppressive nation like there's been in every other instance. It's just Israel on Israel. It's civil war. Israel taking out its own people. We get to chapter 20, verse 1, and we read, All the Israelites from Dan to Beersheba, from the land of Gilead, came out. And the community assembled as one body before the Lord at Mizpah. The leaders of all the people and of all the tribes of Israel presented themselves in the assembly of God's people, 400,000 armed foot soldiers. It's everyone except the Benjaminites. They head up to this Levite, the husband of the murdered woman. And and they say in verse three, tell us, how did this outrage occur? There's some kind of response here that seems like, man, this is wrong, right? And he tells a kind of, Half true version of the story. Look at verse four. I went to Gibeah and Benjamin with my concubine to spend the night. Citizens of Gibeah ganged up on me and surrounded the house at night. They intended to kill me, but they raped my concubine and she died. (laughs) It's interesting, isn't it? How often we try to minimize our own actions and involvement in wrong and tell the narrative of our lives with a positive spin. We all do it. We're so proud and we try and kind of uh, take out the bits that are bad and put forward a better view of ourselves. Israel here decide they need to punish the town of Gibeah. But none of the Benjamite clan want to help. It seems that blood is thicker than justice. So civil war breaks out. Benjamin versus the rest of Israel. And this is a new law. In the start of Judges chapter 1, it's Judah who are sent to fight against the Canaanites, the other nations. In Judges chapter 20, Judah is sent to fight Benjamin itself. Judah go up to fight but they get smashed by Benjamin. 22,000 are killed. The next day, a further 18,000 are killed. The third time they get smashed again. But God says, go tomorrow and I'll give them into your hands. They inquire of God these three times and all he says is to go. 
It's like he's had enough. God was behind each of the three times, but he still wanted to wipe them out. He's like, I've had enough of you, Israel. I've had enough of letting you do your thing. I've had enough of you just living however you want. You can now reap the rewards of your rebellion. We then reach the final battle. Israel ambushed the tribe of Benjamin and they kill all the men in the whole tribe. All of them, except for 600. But it's not just all the men. They go back and put all the towns to the sword as well. All the people. So all that's left of Benjamin is just 600 men. That's it. No women, no children, nothing else left. And they just had this massive massacre because they are so angry at what has gone on. Then they kind of realize what they've done. You know the moment you have sometimes when you do something and then you work out, hang on a minute, what have I just done? They have this brainwave. Maybe we've taken this too far. Maybe I shouldn't have done what I've done. I've nearly annihilated an entire people group of God's nation, one of the tribes, the 12 tribes. This is almost the end of the tribe of Benjamin. And how are we going to see that tribe go on? This is not good. Then there's this stupid promise that they make. 21 verse 1. The men of Israel had sworn an oath at Mizpah. None of us will give his daughter to a Benjaminite in marriage. So the people went to Bethel and sat there before God until evening. They wept loudly and bitterly and cried out, Why, Lord God of Israel, has it occurred that one tribe is missing in Israel today? You think they could have thought about that before they wiped them all out? You know what God says to them? Nothing. He has nothing to say. He is absent from the actions of these nations. There are no Benjaminite women left. They'd killed them all. They'd also sworn an oath that no other tribe of Israel would give their daughters in marriage to a Benjaminite. So now what do they do? Like, we're stuck. We're stupid. You're like, ah, what is wrong with you people? Then they work out there's a town called Jabesh Gilead who hadn't turned up to fight in the war. And so they go, these guys didn't fight. They deserve to be bad. They deserve to be punished for not fighting with us because they didn't join in on this massacre. So they send their soldiers to kill everyone in that town except the unmarried women. And they bring the 400 women and give them to the 600 men from Benjamin. They're like, oh, we're almost sorted, but we're 200 short. But that's okay because once a year at Shiloh, where the true place of worship of God was, right? There's this big party and lots of the girls kind of go there to dance. So they go and they say, right, men of Benjamin, while the girls are dancing, just run out and grab one as your wife. Uh, We'll clear it with all the fathers later. It'll be fine. And this is all so they don't have to break their oath. Then we read in the second last verse of the book of Judges, 21 verse 23. The Benjaminites did this and took the number of women they needed from the dancers they caught. They went back to their own inheritance, rebuilt their cities and lived in them. Now, if you had to finish this talk right now, what would you say? (laughs) How do you make sense of what is going on? You look at the world around us and you go, what's going on? You look at this world, you go, what's going on? The reason I took you through this and to help us understand the story is because I want us to feel the weight of this passage. I think that's what the narrator is trying to do for us. You get to the end and you're like, what is wrong with these people? Like they are crazy. Selfishness, greed, blindness, stupidity, violence, cowardness. And it's just getting started. And there are two verses that are identical to each other at the start of this section and at the end of this section. And they act as as bookends. It's the narrator telling us how to make sense of it all, telling us what the problem with this world is. They're identical. Chapter 17, verse 6 and 21, verse 25. When you see this in the Old Testament, it's like you're seeing a whole big unit that the narrator is showing you what's actually happening here. What do those verses say? 17 verse 6 says, In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did whatever he wanted. 21, 25, In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did whatever he wanted. Have you ever wanted to be like God? Ever wanted to run your life your way without him? Ever wanted to call the shots on life or think you can do a better job than God himself? This is the narrative of what happens when we do that. The chickens have come home to roost and they've turned out looking like mowers, massive, aggressive ones. It is bad what has happened here. 
Micah starts out stealing from his own mother. A priest offers his services to the highest bidder. People um, know what God wants, but they still build idols because they think they can guarantee God's blessing. The Danites massacre the unsuspecting people and take their land that they think it's all okay because, well, they've got their own priest and idol. The men of Gibeah who think homosexuality is fine then pack rape a, a woman and they think they're okay with that. The Levite man throws his own wife out the door to save his own life. Israel bulldoze into a civil war without thinking. They slaughter women and children because a group of men in another town had done something wrong. They make O's without thinking. They make up crazy rules. It helps them get that what they want and around the O's that they've set up. It's like they're some pharisaical lawyer or something. They let young women be kidnapped and taken away. Who knows where? This is messed up. It makes you ask, when the world isn't as it should be, where is God? Where is his judgment on people? Why isn't the God who is in control of all things stepping in and going, stop, shouldn't he be judging him? Well, that's where we see the key to the passage. God is judging them. He's given them over to themselves. He's like, you want to live life your way, do what you see is fit. You don't want to make me king. You think you can be a better king? Watch. If ever we needed <laughs> reminding that, you know, humanity aren't great to rule, this is it, isn't it? Human rulers and governments will never do right because we're sinful and broken. You want to live life with what is right in your own eyes? Well, you can live with the consequences. I tell you, this judgment that they bring upon, them, upon themselves is like no other, isn't it? It's messed up, seriously messed up. And what messed them up was doing what feels right in your own eyes. It's deciding that you're, you're the one who determines what matters most in your life. It's the line, just do whatever you think. You know, whatever's good for you is good for you. That is how they ended up like this. Friends, the book of Judges is a mirror. It shows us the human condition. It shows us what you and I are like if we are left to rule ourselves and the world. The atrocities on the pages of this book. Well, couldn't they be taken from our newspapers today? I read a story 10 years ago. The Herald reported a 15-year-old was beaten to death at a Christchurch flat before his body was dismembered and buried in a graveyard. These stories have been happening. And before we blame everyone else in the world and think everyone else is evil, if we were to take our thoughts and desires and follow through on them, would you or I be much better off? Would we be much different? Think about the times that we, we choose to serve ourselves and focus on ourselves, the greed that we have, or, or we set up a view of the world that we think is right. Just before we moved to New Zealand, we've been um, getting ready and telling people we we're coming here to plant a church. Uh, and it's, it's about you know, six months out before we come and we're like, yep, it's going to be hard work. There's not a, not a large number of people. And, uh, and then I'm at, I'm at a conference with a lot of people from... Um, from my year at college. And at this conference, we're being um, trained in how to be a godly ministers of God's word. And Sarah rings me and says, I'm pregnant. And that was not the plan that we had. We're about to move to a new country, moving with starting a new church with hardly anyone we know in a new country without any kind of support. Um, and then having a child was not part of our plan. And for two days, I wrestled with, maybe we should have bought this child. I knew it was wrong, but I'm like, um, it, maybe it's not the right thing. Maybe we shouldn't have this child because we need to be able to serve God. I was trying to kind of think through it. I wasn't actually going to do it, but it crossed my mind and I was sitting there and I actually thought through it. Friends, if we're left to our own devices, we do all sorts of things, even in the name of God. My, my heart is broken and so is yours. The events of the book of Judges aren't the result of some primitive society. They're the result of a people who have made themselves king and rejected the true king. If we were to live lives our way without God, totally without him, it would be an absolute mess. Even the good laws society has come from God. The question for us today is where is God's judgment? Romans 1 tells us we're living in it. Romans 1.21. 
Paul says this, for though they knew God, they did not glorify him as God nor show gratitude. Instead, their thinking became nonsense and their senseless minds were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man, birds, four-footed animals and reptiles. Therefore, God delivered them over in the cravings of their hearts to sexual impurity so that their bodies were degraded among themselves. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served something created instead of the creator who is praised forever. Amen. Friend, we live in a world that is under the judgment of God when we see the stupidity of the things that we do and the stupidity of the things that others do, we recognize that we're suffering the consequences of our own actions, but that's not where God's judgment will stop. No, he promises that he will end the evil. He will separate us from his goodness forever. The Bible calls that hell, separation from God's goodness. And that the, the judgment we feel now, the judgment we see even here in the book of Judges and how horrific it is, it's just even it's smaller than an entree compared to what is to come. No, we live in a world under the judgment of God. It's just that we don't see it till it slaps us in the face. Till God lets us alone to experience the stupidity of rebellion against him. In the book of Judges, the narrator tells us his verdict. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Four times, he then says, they had no king. No king that would rule with truth and justice, that would do what is right, that would deal with evil. The answer to the problem of the book of Judges is found in the very next verse of the Bible as we go to the book of Ruth. See, Ruth was written, Ruth 1, 1 tells us, during the time of the Judges. Ruth was around in the days when the Judges ruled in the, in the midst of this crazy period of this time. And what we see is that God, throughout that time where all these Judges are stepping in, God is working with one family, one woman, Ruth. And you're like, how will he do this? How will he find the solution to humanity's sinfulness? How will we find a ruler who will lead, a judge that will save? Ruth chapter 4 verse 21 introduces us to her husband, Boaz. Boaz, who fathered Obed. Obed fathered Jesse, who fathered David. See, Ruth and Boaz became the great, great grandparents of King David, who would rule with peace and justice. He would be the king that was after God's own heart, for a while until he would stumble too. But another from David's line would come. See, Ruth isn't just the great, great grandmother of King David, but the great, 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 you work out the number of greats, grandmother of a king called Jesus. Friends, there is another king, the king we've been waiting for, the king they long for, the ruler that helps us to see the world rightly, through whom all sin and all violence will be dealt with. Not now, not fully, but when he returns and every knee bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord, he will deal with it all. But that king knows all and sees all. He doesn't just kind of have a, have a limited view. He sees the messiness of the world we're in. He sees the brokenness and our ugliness and our sin. And he steps into the world stage and says, I'll take the penalty for you. I'll go to hell on the cross for you. Ephesians 2, 4, Paul says this, God, who is rich in mercy, in, in not giving us what we do deserve, because of his great love that he had for us, made us alive with Christ, even though we were dead in trespasses or sin. You are saved by grace as, as an undeserved gift. He also raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavens in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might display the immeasurable riches of his grace through his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For you are saved by grace through faith. This is not from yourselves. It's God's gift, not from works, so that no one can boast. <laughs> we don't need to hoodwink God into some lie that our lives aren't messy. We don't need to pretend that we've got life sorted. We don't, I don't. Just look at our thoughts, our actions, the way we treat others. We're shockers. As we look at the world around us, we don't need to pretend that, oh, but it's okay. It's doing well. No, it's not okay. The messiness of the world is a messiness that we create. The problem of the world we see is the problem of humanity's rejection against God. Romans tells us that creation is groaning, waiting for one to rule it. The one Jesus who would come. 
But the messiness we see and the messiness you and I create is not the last word. Jesus is the saviour we need. He's offered us his life and forgiveness and hope that lasts as a free gift. How amazing is God that he sees what we're like. He sees our messiness and he offers to clean it up himself. The only way to escape the messiness and the consequences of our messiness is to come to the one and true saviour and king Jesus is to accept his death in our place, his mercy, and drink that in, to revel in the undeserved gift of Jesus' death for us. Friends, the book of Judges and the brokenness that we see, the the brokenness of the world around us is a massive sign of the judgment we deserve and how great a salvation we've been offered. The mercy we've been shown by God that our sins can be forgiven and our future that lasts forever, a relationship with God that does not end, could be ours. The greatest tragedy in the book of Judges would be to look into it and fail to see it as a mirror into my heart and yours. It would be to miss our own sinfulness and think that we've got the world together, to see the world through our own eyes and think that we can be king and do whatever we see as fit and therefore miss the mercy of a better and greater and truer Saviour and King, Jesus. Our sins, they are so many, aren't they? But His mercy is more. So the book of Judges places us in this position where we need to come and trust the King that the Bible reveals in Jesus. Put your life in his hands. Praise God for his mercy, that he doesn't treat us as we deserve, that we can be forgiven. And that's happened while we were still dead. We do nothing to deserve it. Praise God that his mercy is more than our sin. And be amazed, be captivated by Jesus. I am so thankful that God doesn't treat me as I deserve. Come to Jesus. Trust him. Let's pray. Father God, your mercy is incredible. We deserve to be treated like the horrific acts that have happened in the book of Judges play out. We deserve to be pushed away from your presence and to have no life at all because we've rejected you. You know our thoughts. You know our actions. You know the things that we have done and the things that we plan to do and the things that we're doing right now. And yet you still show us mercy. You do not give us what we deserve, not right now, for we're still alive. By your spirit and through your word, convict us personally. Convict us as a church to put Jesus first, not in order to be saved, but because he saved us. Help us to run to Jesus, to drink in from the mercy you've shown us in him and to live our lives so thankful that it just overflows to the world around us because we've seen how great a forgiveness we've been offered. Father God, use your word in our hearts today by your spirit as a mirror that we might see ourselves clearly and you clearly and propel us out into your world for your glory that people might see your amazing love and mercy shown to us in Jesus. We pray this in his name. Amen.